Well, the only thing that we know about conference realignment at this point is that it seems to be a revolving door of never ending. Um, well, right now, litigation and uh, money exchanging hands and uh, TV deals, the whole nine. But we are entrenched in a heck of a lawsuit right now over in Florida and North Carolina, which we will get into. We're here to discuss conference realignment with the voice of college football himself, Mark Rogers. Mark, how you doing today, man? Doing good, Justin. Appreciate you being here with me. Yeah. Uh, I guess I got that kind of turned around. I'm so used to saying, <laughs> hey, thanks for joining, but uh, I'm joining you two today. Oh, yeah, so thanks for the invite. I was going to say, you're already in the interviewer mode. Um, Mark, of course, yeah, from the Voice of College Football, um, I'm over at the Nebraska channel. Sonny is over at the Texas channel now. Sonny, how you doing today, man? You got your first video up on the Texas channel over there? Uh, it's not up yet, uh, it, but it'll be up shortly. And, uh, you know, yeah, I'm grateful for Mark for giving me that opportunity. For those of you who are really confused right now, who uh, watch me on Big Ten Show and uh, Illini Cast, uh, I actually have a house about 18 minutes from uh, DKR Stadium. So, uh, you know, Mark wanted someone with boots on the ground, and uh, that's why I'm uh, grateful for the opportunity that he's provided me. Yep. So, Mark, we thank you for taking the time to come on here today. And um, we're going to get into a little bit of the uh, the realignment stuff that that everybody loves to hear. And it's perfect timing. We decided to do this because of the whole lawsuit situation going on between the ACC and Florida State. As we know, uh, about a week ago, um, there was a lawsuit filed where the ACC um, wanted to file the lawsuit in North Carolina. Um, and that whole situation happened. You know, it was it was determined that. Um, each of these cases can continue independently. Florida State, of course, um, had their lawsuit filed in Florida in Leon County, and the ACC wanted to defer that so theirs can be handled in North Carolina first or to liken the probability that they would let the lawsuit be handled in North Carolina as opposed to Florida. Of course, FSU wants it handled in Florida as opposed to North Carolina. And what we know now, both lawsuits are going to continue independently, one in North Carolina that the ACC filed, one in Florida that Florida State filed. Things are getting a little hairy here. There's a, there's a lot to it. I'm leaving out a lot of specific details because I'm sure we'll get into that here um, as we go through this. But just first things first, Mark, what is your overarching thoughts in hearing about the judge's decision today the one in leon county not in the one in uh mackenberg county in north carolina what is your thoughts on that and and who do you think right here has the power in this situation or who do you think's right who do you think's wrong well uh, i believe that the acc is making the claim that the league is centered in north carolina therefore these yeah. cases need to be heard in north carolina florida state is countering with our physical property, the games in the future that are under the jurisdiction of the grant of rights that we're trying to get out of, they will be played in Tallahassee, Florida. Therefore, this needs to be heard uh, in Florida. And as mm -hmm. you just mentioned, uh, basically both courts in North Carolina, federal court, and now most recently this week in Florida, basically came to the same determination that these need to be heard, not dismissed, and they're going to carry through at least to the next stage. Meanwhile, the ACC is fighting two more fronts against Clemson, both in the state of South Carolina and in the state of North Carolina. Correct. Yep. Yeah. And, and they're basically, you know, what Florida State's contesting is essentially that what they did, what, what the ACC did was procedural fencing. And basically what they did was they were trying to um, – basically put the lawsuit in before Florida States was in essentially. And so that there was no actual damages incurred yet by the ACC. However, that the ACC's lawsuit was filed in preparation of potential damages, which then that puts it in a weird situation. Um, and then also what it was, was basically what I've heard is that the board of trustees, um, out there the meeting was required to be public due to florida's sunshine laws i read this somewhere i cannot remember where and that the acc didn't follow their own bylaws by requiring other members of the conference to approve the lawsuit against florida state and that's where they said the acc filed the suit before they even incurred any damages expected by the florida state filing 
and it was done to increase their odds of getting it handled North Carolina, like you said, where the ACC is based out of. Um, and so it seems like, to me, it seems like the ACC is a little bit of a reactive stance here as Florida State being the the one really that is at large here and and has a, has a gripe. Um, but I just I don't see this ending well for the ACC. There's been a much a much of a, a conversation about how the ACC has been kind of a good old boys club of of sorts um, type of deal. And um, all this was outlined in a comment I read for somebody who really knows a lot about the legality of this and stuff like that. So, Sonny, what is your overarching thoughts on this? And and do you think you know who do you think comes out of this unscathed, or do you think both parties end up a loser in this? And how? I can't see what version Florida State comes out looking like a loser here. Um, I think the same people who a year ago kept, uh, you know, pounding on the idea of grant of rights that was unbreakable, those even those folks are starting to back down a little bit and you're starting to hear, well, maybe if they paid the X amount or Y amount. Um, Florida State, you know, I think it's just a matter of time. For me, it's more, does the ACC just get tired of battling on this front? Uh, you know, they have... The longer, the more money that they spend between Florida State and Clemson lawsuits, more time they're wasting on possibly, you know, shoring up the conference on the other end. And so, that, I mean, that's what it all comes down to. It's a simple matter of how long do you want this to drag on? Uh, how strong of a case do you think you have? I can't imagine it can be that strong because I haven't really seen an unbiased source tell me that the. Uh, Ultimately, the Florida State's going to have to stick with uh, the ACC or pay, play like you know, 500, 600 million dollars, whatever um, silly numbers that you're hearing. So uh, for me, if I'm Jim Phillips, you know, former Northwestern AD, I try to negotiate and try to get it done, you know, uh, be uh, ready for the next step, essentially, and uh, shore up the teams that I do have in tow uh, if I want to seek out teams to replace these two sure uh it's just not going to happen they're not going to be a power two moving forward but that doesn't mean the conference needs to die mm -hmm. yeah essentially yeah right now because if fsu leaves they would have to pay what 130 140 mil just with a withdrawal fee uh that's what uh, acc attorney jim cooney said um and florida state maintains it lose hundreds of millions and forfeiting media rights for the next 12 years um you know, in, in Florida states arguing that it's their money, their media rights. And, you know, the ACC is arguing the Florida State breach contract when we know both, you know, ACC also didn't follow their own bylaws. So, Mark, based on, you know, kind of the the ins and outs of this, in your opinion, um, do you think they come to a resolution in this of exchanging money in Florida? You know, what, what do you think comes from this in regards to the ACC and Florida State? And do you think the ACC at this point is just kind of, um, you know, a wash? Eh? Because you would have to assume one domino is going to lead to the, you know, the next couple of dominoes coming out of there and then what's left of that conference. But what do you think uh, is the kind of result of this? Do you think it's just uh, exchanging of money, Florida State eventually departs? To extend on what uh, Sonny had to say, my take on this situation has really not changed for quite a long time because once there became a contentious situation between Florida State and Mike Alford, their current athletic director, from the time he was interviewing for the job, even before he took the job at Florida State, he did a great deal of research into Florida State's situation with the grant of rights, and he he is prepared for this moment. He has hired research firms, consulting firms, legal representation, going back a couple years leading up to this point. He's been gunning for this. And Florida State, even though Clemson's now involved, has obviously been the most vocal about their situation and, and being disgruntled about the situation. So on, on one hand, on the surface, you would think, okay, well, who held a gun to your head? You signed the grant of rights. It runs through 2036. It's a bad deal. But as I like to remind people, there's a difference between it being a, a bad deal, but the ACC also, pardon me, ACC fans, being a pretty bad football conference. So let's understand the disparity between what the Big Ten teams are currently receiving and what they're going to receive with the new contract versus that 
contrasted to the ACC. Yes, the ACC is worth more than that. It was a bad deal, but they're not worth the $90 million that the SEC and the and the uh, Big Ten teams are worth collectively. So it is not that bad of a deal. It breaks the $40 million threshold, I believe, this season. Uh, when have we ever seen, whether that's in a personal situation or a business situation, where two parties that were this contentious have maintained a relationship for that long? It's just not going to happen. Uh, the ACC has been screwed for a long, long time because what were they going to do? Even if their grant of rights was completely rock solid and binding, or were they going to hold all these institutions until 2036, knowing that at 2036, their league is going to dissolve and implode and everybody's going to scatter because this is such a bad deal and they're holding everyone against their will. So I believe this is going to be, and I'm no lawyer by any stretch of the imagination. I believe this is going to get settled out of court. Yep. I don't believe that the ACC and ESPN, its broadcasting partner, want this to go to discovery because the details that we've already discovered and learned don't really shine a positive light on the good faith naturedness of the ACC in particular and ESPN in negotiating with these 14 schools. Not at all. Yeah, agreed. And, and, and to your point, I think that's very well put. And to your point, just kind of like and beyond this, too, because it's very likely that it will get handled, you know, settled out of court because really nobody wants to take it. It's going to end up in the Supreme Court. Nobody wants to take this to that level, you know. Um, so with that being said, if Florida State was to branch out, and I'll ask this to both of y'all, because if Florida State was to leave, um, you know, general consensus for the most part was that they fit in the SEC. Um the other argument with the Big Ten is that the Big Ten doesn't want them because of the AAU status. The AAU, of course, the Association of American Universities, and it's you know in the leading research universities. Um, but Florida State has outlined a strategic plan of uh, 2023 to 2027 to get into the AAU. They said they have a bold vision for Florida State that goes well beyond becoming a top 10 public university an AAU member institution where we're imagining, reimagining how a top university can harness research, innovation, entrepreneurial spirit, build a better future for the state, nation, and world. There's this full outline planned. So, Mark, what is your, um, I'll start with you, Mark, what is your take on Florida State's potentially joining another conference? And do you think the AAU status or what you feel the Big Ten wants from a university coming in and does Florida State offer that? So the people watching us care about football, they care about sports, yeah. but academics do matter in the Big Ten in particular. Do they matter as much as maybe we thought, including myself a few years ago with the likes of Stanford and Cal and the weight of those universities being out there? And we'll, we'll, we'll have to see down the line how this all comes together because it could be a very different college football landscape in terms of the model and format of these leagues a few years from now, and it may just come back around to something close to what it was 10 years ago. But yes, to your point, Justin, geographically, that's not debatable. Florida State belongs in the SEC. They have rivalries of sort, of course, with Florida, first and foremost, but with the schools, they have they have a series. They have history with those schools. They basically have no connection with anyone in the Big Ten. However, um, they have really sought to improve their academic status in recent decades. Their academic ranking based on uh, U.S. News and World Report has uh, gone into the 50s. They would rank as a mid-tier Big Ten University right now in terms of academic rankings, and they've surpassed Miami, and, and they have Clemson by 30 spots uh, in those rankings, and they very much want to be looked upon as a serious uh, academic school. Uh, in terms of the AAU status, um, you outlined it very well, Justin, in terms of their pursuit also to be noted is that they were in the final round this last go around Miami received uh, that status, but Florida state was in that final 17. And also I believe membership in the big 10 would then put them in a position where um, 
this AAU status has been reviewed every couple of years yeah. in the last decade. So I think that they're very close to gaining that status. And I think when you put it all together, that's where they want to be, meaning the Big Ten, even though the football and the history is very much aligned with the SEC. Yeah, agreed there. And uh, Sonny, what's your take on that? I mean, the Big Ten's not going to take a bad school. But if Notre Dame called tomorrow and said, finally, we're ready to join the conference, they would waive any sort of perception of requirements for that uh, program. And Notre Dame is not an AAU school. Um, technically, all the schools in the Big Ten now aren't AAU schools anymore. You know, they all were when they entered, but they they are no longer. I think um, the upside that Florida State brings to the conference, uh, you know, obviously, you know, the SEC is taking on the role of, you know, the more the Southern Conference, whereas the, the Big Ten is wants to be more national. It's hard to be a national conference if you don't have one of the key states in your fold. And Florida being one of those, you know, probably what top two, top three states that produce uh, football talent. Um, that's just a place where even like it's good for the Ohio States. It's good for the Michigan to, to have an imprint uh, down in that state. And so, you know, as long as Florida State wasn't in the 150s, 200s, as Mark was kind of referring to, and they're slowly, you know, climbing academically. For them, you have the conversation just for the sake of having the conversation. But because I think we all know that the Notre Dame situation, like they, they're not AAU and they would be accepted without blink. Um, I think the same would apply for Florida State. So, you know, I think this is a football decision as pretty much all the decisions have been for the X amount of years. And, and real quick, Justin, just to um, emphasize something that Sonny hit on just a second ago, and I've been saying this for a long, long time, if I'm the Big Ten, and this was even pre-USC-UCLA decision, I'm going to Florida and I'm getting Miami and Florida State. That's what I would do because the schools are really good. But what does the Big Ten have? The Big Ten has everything. Yep. Eyeballs, rear ends in the seats, facilities, money, academic staff, everything. What does the Big Ten not have? Enough football players. Yep. Yep. And yep. really, Ohio State has proven to be the only school that can pretty much go down there and do what they want. Then you've got a layer with Michigan, Penn State that go down there and get some second tier guys. But to get Florida State and Miami to, to put a flag down there for the Big Ten, I think would be huge and what the Big Ten should do. It, oh, go ahead, Sonny. Well, I was also thinking, like, you know, again, to kind of ride the coattails of what Mark just said, like, Big Ten's not in Texas either. So that's kind of why the SEC is loaded up with all these athletes with all this talent. They've got two of the, you know, most producing football talent uh, states in the country. And so for the Big Ten to kind of at least cut that advantage in half with a school that's openly interested in joining you, I think it's a no brainer. Like, you know, obviously, Texas uh, is not going anywhere. Uh, Texas A&M probably is not going anywhere. Is the Big Ten open to taking, like, one of the lesser schools in Texas? Maybe. I don't know. But you have a juggernaut in Florida already ready to join you. And so I feel like it's a no-brainer for the conference. Is is there – so I know because it does for the Big Ten to plant your flag in the backyard of SEC territory – or the footprint, so to speak, would give the Big Ten a theoretical like, okay, like we're right in your backyard. You can't have this team. You can't have this region, you know, all to yourself. But is there any part of it, you know, with the Big Ten and the SEC working together where there's any alignment on kind of some of these moves that come from this, you know, because even Fox and ESPN, I, I think, are moving towards a streaming app together or something like that. Is there any indication from either of y'all that y'all think that that somehow plays a factor in this and that the two sides work together on trying to formulate a plan that maybe works out for the betterment of the two conferences in the future. And, and it's less of a jousting of, we want to get a team in your backyard. Let's try to pull this team. And then the sec is like, no, we're going to go try to get this team. You know, we're going to go try to get Notre Dame now. Um, what are y'all's thoughts on that? Uh, we'll start with you. Uh, we'll start with you, Sonny. And then we'll go to Mark. I mean, I, I think, the SEC knows that the Big Ten's not going anywhere, and the Big Ten knows the SEC's not going anywhere. Uh, it's essentially become a power to landscape that we're in. So, I mean, it, I don't know if they trust each other, 
But I think they kind of understand that, you know, there's going to be a little give and take back and forth uh, every now and then. And I think, again, they're working together, but I wouldn't exactly call them allies, if that makes sense. Um, They understand that the other needs to exist. Um, Moving forward, you know, when these media TV deals are done, you know, obviously we've heard of the potential super leagues or this and that. And, you know, maybe they've already kind of, you know, written it down on a napkin, what that could kind of look like. So they're not really trying to piss each other off. But I mean, they've already won. In the new landscape of college football, the Big Ten has is victorious. The SEC has won. So it's, it's a simple matter of, you know, just kind of working in tandem while still looking out for your best interests yourself too. Mark? You know, when these acquisitions started, meaning Oklahoma, Texas, and then USC, UCLA, it was my thought that where is this going to end? Well, this is a sport that's owned by the SEC and the Big Ten, as Sonny has outlined. Therefore, what is driving this? What is going to drive it and what has driven it to this point has been one of two things. Either the SEC or the Big Ten, one of them has just made a move. So it's punch, counter punch. We have to offset their last move. Therefore, we're going to get the next best commodity on the table. And also with that, the evaluation of those programs to say, if we add program X or programs X and Y, do they add value to everything that we're trying to do? And the most quantifiable one is the TV contract and going to the the, the media partner and saying, if we had Oregon and Washington, what do they do to our TV contract? Well, they will do X, Y, and Z. Okay, well, we're going to give them a half distribution rate for a certain amount of time. Yeah. Um, but with the announcement of this advisory committee, as Sonny has outlined, it's, it's very intriguing to see because COVID, the COVID season basically outlined what college football is. It's just a free for all. Just every yeah. conference is out for itself. It's just going to do what it. And now with NIL and the transfer portal, we're seeing that more than anything. Uh, Greg Sankey is hired by the SEC. He's going to work for the SEC. He's not working for the good of college football. Tony Petiti, the same thing. He is working for the Big Ten. People expect sometimes in the conversations I have with fans for these guys to be working for the good of college football. Well, if they have a really big picture look at it, they might may want to drive it in that direction, but they're working for their conference. Therefore, I think we're either going to continue in this grab up territory approach, or these two are going to trust each other enough, as Sonny says, probably not infinitely, but trust each other enough to say, this sport's really dysfunctional and the two of us need to take hold of it and kind of restructure the whole thing, take hold of NIL, take hold of paying players, take hold of all of this, transfer portal, everything involved, and run the run the sport And we will include the Big 12 slash ACC to whatever extent we believe it's it's good for the sport or good for us. But we're going to control the sport. So we're going to have to work together and then let's distribute the the schools and the teams probably very close to what it already is. But um, look at the chess pieces left, which is basically Clemson, Florida State, Notre Dame. Miami, North Carolina to a certain extent, and then it drops off significantly from there and determine what's best for this sport because it's going to be best for us in the long run as well that we need to cooperate and run this sport going forward yeah and the way you outlined it there this popped in my head it reminds me and i'm not going to get into politics i promise but the political structure where it's like you know republicans and democrats they theoretically are opponents but they kind of work almost in unison as a unit to kind of keep the population needing the government and in a way that's almost essentially what we're going to get here is like yes the the big 10 and the sec right now are propping up the game of college football and they know that the power they have and so is it in their best interest to to battle each other tooth and nail or is it in their best interest to maybe not necessarily like each other but like know that working together gets them both to more money in the future and also makes these other teams and people reliant on them they need us we don't need them and that's kind of the separation that 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 it's it's kind of moving towards and then of course we mentioned some other teams in here as well 
um, besides just Florida State. We've talked about the Notre Dames and stuff like that. Branching the conversation over into more teams, let's say the dominoes do begin to fall. What are some other teams that we could see enter these conferences? And what do y'all think are the most likely teams to enter the Big Ten uh, conference? Uh, we'll, we'll start with you, Mark. Well, uh, I would have told you a couple of years ago, and I was completely wrong, at least at this point. I would have told you Stanford and Cal. Not so much Cal, but I think that they may have been a, a tag along like UCLA was with USC. Uh, but as it stands right now, uh, as I stated just a second ago, I think there's a pretty significant drop off after Miami and North Carolina. I think that there are good points but very weak points to everybody else left on the table. If you look at a Georgia Tech, strong university, historic brand actually in the history of college football, Atlanta, Georgia, are you kidding me? Atlanta, Houston produce more NFL players than anyone. Do they go to Georgia Tech though? Does Do people go to the games? Do people watch them on TV? Um, and then there's some recency bias that it's a horrible football program, but it doesn't have to be one. It wasn't 10 years ago, they were going to Orange Bowls and ACC championship games. So, but you can definitely see the pros and the cons with a number of schools like Georgia Tech, NC State, Louisville that are on the fence. Pitt that plays in an NFL stadium in front of 35,000 people that, again, generally the market doesn't care, even though they're in a top 20 or 25 market, but still it's a really strong historic football brand. It's in a good portion of the country, rivalry with Penn State. They could probably rekindle something there. Um, so every school has its pros and cons that are pretty decided for me past Miami and North Carolina, who I think are safe in terms of their landing in one of these two conferences. I think it, you know, it, it all ultimately comes down to what Mark talked about earlier you know these universities would be open to other schools as long as their bottom line doesn't change and you know i hate to say it like i don't know if any pittsburgh fans are watching this but adding pittsburgh to the big 10 is not going to benefit ohio state michigan usc in any sort of way uh you know for me you have notre dame you have uh you know clemson miami florida state and north carolina those schools, I think, could help. Miami, I'm not as familiar with their numbers as uh, you know, you two gentlemen probably are. Um, but I think we're basically at a deciding point where the Big Ten's got to decide what they what number they want to settle on. The SEC's got to decide how many teams they want to settle on. Then again, we named like the four or five no-brainers. It's a matter of you know, which side that they want to join. And yep. then maybe one of the mid-tier teams uh, that uh, Mark mentioned might get lucky just because they there's an open slot to fill yep but beyond that you know I, I just think this is what's happening moving forward now we've talked about notre dame being potentially the best fit now who do you think is the worst fit for the big 10 conference which team and me i believe it would be miami but what are y'all's quick hits on who you think it would be the worst fit for the conference the one team that you say like there's no chance that this team will get in the big 10 Clemson. Yep. Clemson. Okay. They're buried in the eighties in academic ranking and that's fallen in the last five yeah. years. They are very much a Southern school steeped in rivalries with South Carolina and Georgia. I just think, sure. Is that a great football edition? Yes, absolutely. Do they draw people on television? Yes. Post Dabo Sweeney, they draw people on television. Yeah. Prior to that, they are a, Wisconsin program. Yeah. Uh, Debo Sweeney has obviously elevated them. We don't know if he can sustain that because obviously they have not been the Clemson of 2020 and before that, uh, the last three seasons. So that that would be the, the, the program that has weight and value that's not a good fit for the Big Ten for me. Yeah, I'd have to agree. And Sonny, uh, Sonny's camera froze up, so we, we lost him there. Uh, Clemson, yeah, Clemson, very good point. I just... For me, Miami too is just like in in the the way Miami has been as a university over the years and the the reputation they have too. It's just something that I, yeah, Clemson Miami I can't see joining, um, but I would not be upset to see like you said, Florida State's really making a point to increase their standing in terms of academics and everything. 
the biggest thing here is kind of like you mentioned before, you know, football is king, but these other, you know, parts of the athletic department are going to matter too. And then, you know, the biggest thing that's going to be weighed out with these teams, because, you know, the Big Ten uh, right now, the conferences, the Big Ten right now, 18 teams, SEC 16, it's going to be geographic footprint and then money versus overhead, uh, money versus, you know, how much you're going to pay and travel and those things too, because money isn't the only thing there. How much is it costing you to, you know, travel across the country, you know, to, to board your teams up in hotels, like all that stuff matters too. It's not just profit. And then, yeah, like I said, all programs, you know, Notre Dame being the old school independent, it, it seems like at some point Notre Dame's hand is going to be forced in this be, albeit, you know, whether it be because of the TV deals kind of, you know, there, of course, the TV deals are favoring teams in conferences. Notre Dame's not going to make as much money. Um, then you have your Clemson, Florida States that are great athletic programs, and Florida State getting back better academically. Where you say, Mark? Well, I'm intrigued by Notre Dame as well. Yeah, uh, I don't blame Notre Dame for their independence. Some people believe that I do. I don't hold it against them. They do what's best for Notre Dame. Yeah. I blame the rest of college football for allowing that to continue. We are now, we've arrived at a situation, and forget whoever else is on that independent list, mm -hmm. UConn and Army. Yeah. It doesn't matter. No. It's Notre Dame. Yeah. Everybody else is in a conference. So as long as these, uh, you know, going back to our discussion about the SEC and the Big Ten staying separate or partnering in some fashion, if they partner in some fashion, I would freeze out Notre Dame. I would basically say, we're not scheduling you, including you, unless you join a conference. The only issue there is that the SEC doesn't benefit from Notre Dame joining the Big Ten. Of course, that's the logical decision. So what's the SEC's incentive to do that to Notre Dame if they're only going to, to, to be on the losing side of the Notre Dame entry into a conference? But I fully believe that Notre Dame should be in a conference. They should be forced to be in a conference. Yep. Agreed. Yeah. Sonny, we were just talking about Notre Dame, uh, potential hand being forced and, you know, whether it be for the, the money stuff for them getting a smaller cut of the TV deal or, you know, just like market outline, just somebody making it a point to lock them out until they join a conference just because, yeah, I mean, it, it may help, Notre Dame and scheduling and stuff like that, but it doesn't help them financially. And it, it definitely doesn't help the conferences to just leave them out and continue to schedule. So what's your thoughts on the whole Notre Dame situation? I know you mentioned that they would, of course, be the team that's most suited for the Big Ten. But what are your thoughts on that and the, the mechanism to get them there? I think ultimately it's the, going to be the TV networks, you know, and then the deal that they have with, uh, you know, NBC and in five years, let's check in. In six years, let's check in. You know, 10 million different might not make such a big deal right now. But as you compound that and you have schools like the University of Illinois making that much more money than a university like Notre Dame, maybe the results on the field starts diminishing a little bit. And all of a sudden, you know, Notre Dame fans are diehard fans. They are very passionate college football fans. And so they may realize that, you know, hey, if you want to win national championships, the only way to do it is to join one of these power two. I, I that's just not a fan base. I know uh, they love the idea that they're independent and they love to, you know, lift their nose uh, towards other people who think that they shouldn't be. But I think that can only last so long. Eventually, if they become, you know, right now they they can finish in the top ten annually. But ultimately, if they start finishing in, you know, from the fifteen to twenty five range or the twenty to twenty five range. Uh, I don't think that's enough for the Irish faithful. And I think at that point, uh, the conversations will start happening. You know, uh, pressure is going to be put on the AD and, uh, you know, the conversations we'll have with uh, the media networks and try to make it whole and uh, get them back to prominence. Yep. And just to to add on to that, are there any other teams, anything else that y'all would like to speak on in regards to the SEC or the Big Ten joining them or any other teams of note? I mean, for me, I Notre Dame is a clear number one, and I understand Florida State being a, a key uh, target as well. But I, I just love the University of North Carolina. I just, you know, I think Chapel Hill is a beautiful campus. Uh, it's a very highly regarded academic institution. Yeah. 
Um, their basketball team, of course, is historic. Uh, you know, they from that for me, like they seem to be the one university that doesn't want the ACC to go anywhere just because they've got the homegrown roots there. And so they're trying not to let it happen. But I think that's the one school that is probably 60 40 SEC. But that's like the one battleground uh, university that's uh, still kind of looming out there. Whereas when you think of the others, you kind of have a pretty strong lean which side that they're going. I think Notre Dame or sorry, North Carolina is trying to stay out of it. But once they have to make a decision, I really do think that uh, both of these conferences are going to go all out to try to woo them uh, to their side. There was a Super League uh, proposed in media circles in this last week of 80 teams. And it's an interesting concept and it's interesting to discuss and look at. I don't think it's very viable uh, unless the sport would be aided by various factions to be able to support those remaining teams that bring no additional value to the TV contract. So I think we're headed to a place, unfortunately, where Wake Forest, Boston College, those schools get relegated to what is going to be a new brand of group of five football and maybe given some kind of small entryway into an opportunity to make a playoff as maybe the rep of one of 70 or whatever the number is, uh, something currently like we have with this 12-team college football playoff model. Um, I, I don't like that. Uh, I hope that that if this is headed in the direction we all see it, that the SEC and the Big Ten at least allow for for the Big 12, if no one else, to survive and be a contributor. We already know that they're only going to give them a 32% share compared to 58%. So they've already deemed them not suitable, not to their standards. And that is less about what's on the field. I would love to see it play out on the field first, but regardless of how it plays out on the field, uh, the SEC and the Big Ten bring the eyeballs. So that's already been substantiated and can be predicted of what's going to drive the revenue for this playoff and their SEC and Big Ten teams. Um, so I, I hope that we're able to sustain some semblance of national college football where all regions are represented to a large degree and we just don't have these gulfs or gaffes uh, in coverage uh, in the map of college football from coast to coast. For sure. Yep. Sonny, anything to uh, to tag onto that with before we uh, conclude the show? No, you know, it's just one of those topics that I know we're all tired of, but uh, every other day there's a new piece of information. Uh, once the final verdict with the Florida State, you know, issue is resolved. I think then all of a sudden things are going to move a lot faster and uh, you're going to see a lot of universities we talked about just now really realizing that they're going to have to make a decision rather quickly. And uh, I'm not sure if I'm looking forward to it or not. Uh, I'm just looking forward to stop talking about it. <laughs> Justin, yep. uh, if, if you allow me, I'm going yeah, to good. leave the conversation by opening Pandora's box, which right. may allow for a future conversation. All right, let's do it. We just mentioned that the Big Ten and the SEC have demanded, basically, and my thought here is that they demanded more playoff distribution to either say this is what's going to be required for us to stay uh, as part of a larger landscape of power conferences, that this is going to suffice, or we might as well make more money than everyone else before we decide to branch out and do our own thing anyway. Uh, so however that turns out, we shall see. But if that's the approach of the Big Ten and the SEC, and I completely understand it, it's, it's, it's validated based on the TV ratings, what keeps, especially if players are going to be paid going forward and there's going to be some semblance of a salary cap or revenue distribution given to the schools to pay those players, what is going to stop the Ohio State's, Georgia's, fill in the blanks of the world from going to the Big Ten and saying, similar to what you did to your partners in terms of giving the Big Ten a larger distribution revenue, 
who's making all the money for the Big Ten. Yep. You give us a greater distribution model and slice of the pie. Yeah, and then it then it's going to turn into a gigantic civil war, and and that's what it's already turned into. It's the one of those things. It's going to be all of these teams now. It's just it's you know it is what it is. At the end of the day, it's the NCAA had always been a business that was about themselves. And now that the pie is getting spread around, you know, everybody wants their piece and everybody's arguing that this cut is mine, this cut is mine. Yeah. So it's going to get very, very hairy as it already has. It's going to continue to get hairy. And uh, like Sonny said, it's just right now, it's just a matter of, of a lot of speculation over the last months and years over, over this stuff. And, it seems the the longer we go, the more speculation flies around, the less we know. But very soon we're we're going to start seeing more dominoes fall, and and then you know when those fall, other ones will open up, and we'll be talking about different stuff in terms of realignment and the the next teams that are going to join. So as as much as things change, they always stay the same in in regards to this stuff. So. A lot to talk about here, a lot to take in. Hopefully, we broke that down in a way that is easy to understand. If you do not know about the lawsuit, there is a ton of articles uh, outlining it in further detail. So go check those out. Um, Mark, you know, do you want to tell people where they could find you, what you got going on right now, and stuff like that? And links to all of Mark's stuff will be in the description as well. Yes, uh, we are the voice of college football, so please join us. Uh, discussion, debate, and analysis on a daily basis. We so much appreciate Justin being our main uh, content creator and host on the Nebraska channel. So we've got 23 channels in addition to our main national channel. We appreciate Sonny and all that he's done in recent months. And you can catch Sonny's work in addition to what he's doing here uh, on our Texas channel that we are relaunching here on April 15th, along with a big Texas launch party uh, that you can catch us live at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And that day as well on April 15th, uh, we are going to wake up college football bright and early at 8 a.m. Eastern time. At least that's bright and early for me and launching a new show that's a bit different than other things and ventures that we've pursued at the voice of college football so we we hope that uh, uh everyone gives that a shot and again that's a wake up college football starting monday april 15th so now basically it, it, at this point the voice of college football is football around the clock you have mornings then you have your after dark shows and everything in between so um if you are a fan of college football in general uh, get over there, and if you are a fan of any specific teams, make sure you make it over to the team at channel and conference channels. It's growing, it's growing, it's growing as uh, we go along. So um, a lot of good stuff going on there. Uh, you can go wa my, uh, watch Mark play tic-tac-toe trivia and um, really struggle at the tic-tac-toe tic -tac -toe part. So. Um, all right, well, Sonny, anything before we uh, conclude the show here for the people? Nope. Uh, just make sure you hit that like button, the subscribe button while you're here. Uh, and definitely check out Mark Rogers' uh, TV channel as well. Uh, you know, he's been one of my inspirations to start this whole thing. So it's nice to see, uh, you know, X amount of years later, uh, I'm working side by side with him. Yep. He gave me a shot into this space and, and here we are. So I appreciate uh, your time, Mark, and I'm sure we'll have you back on in the future. So um, like Sonny said, if y'all like what we're doing here, please consider liking and subscribing. Go check out Mark's channels and uh, social media and uh, follow him in the description below. But that being said, we will see you on the next video. Peace.